Test. Test, test, testing, testing. As we come to worship him, let's focus upon him in our prayer at this time. Loving Father, we recognize that you are here. And figuratively, we are taking off our shoes for we realize this is holy ground. For you have entered into this sacred cathedral of time called the Sabbath. And we come as a church family to celebrate how good you have been to each of us during this week. Anoint our time together. May the angels join us in singing. May our hearts be open to your Holy Spirit. For we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I have one announcement that I would like to give. It did not make it into the bulletin, excuse me. We have a first reading that was not listed in your bulletin. It will be second reading next week. And let me try to read the names. And if you're here today and I mispronounce the name, will you forgive me? Andre and Irena Bedala from the Sacramento Slavic Church in Carmichael, California. Are you here? I hope I didn't slaughter your name too badly. There you are. Thank you. Thank you. Then we also have a family from the Fort Worth First Church, Crystal, Nathan, Keon, and Elion Bereos from this church. And again, this will be second reading next week. We'll vote on it at that time. We have other announcements. We ask you to look up at the screen, and you'll see those announcements at this time. Hey, church family. Welcome to our weekly family reunion. I'm Mason. And I'm Vivian. We've got a lot of exciting events coming up, so let's jump right in. First up, if you've got a heart for service, consider joining our Meals on Wheels team. We're delivering hot meals to home bond seniors in Burleson. We could really use your help. That's right. If you can just give us just one Friday a month from 11.30 to 12.30 to deliver meals, we'd love to have you on the team. 
speak with John Justice or contact the church office to get involved. Ladies, next up is our women's ministry event tonight, September 20th at 3.30 p.m. It's going to be a wonderful time of spiritual growth, refreshments, and some fun with the craft. Now let's not forget, during this event, we'll also be revealing our secret sisters. If you've been part of this program, this is your chance to find out who has been blessing you all season. If you can't make it, let us know so we can get your surprise to you. Looking ahead to October 5th, we've got two awesome events for you. First, start your morning with breakfast with the family from 9.15 to 10 a.m. We'll be gathering for a delicious breakfast and a chance to connect with one another. There's nothing like starting your day with good food and even better, company. Breakfast is my favorite. Then, later that evening at 7.15 p.m., all ladies are welcome to our Women's Restaurant Social. They'll be meeting at the Torque Grill in Brosid for some amazing Tex-Mex food, laughter, and fellowship. Whether you're vegan, vegetarian, or just love Tex-Mex, there's something for everyone. We hope to see you there. Now, there's a great way to inspire the next generation, our event. Our adventurers would love to hear your personal stories of faith. If you got an adventure with Jesus to share, sign up for a 15 minute devotional during one of the kids' club worships. It's a fun kids' corner style opportunity to connect with the kids. The club meets every other Sabbath at 4 p.m. and you can sign up at the Connect Corner. Awesome, and don't forget about our text options to help you fully engage during this service. Absolutely. If you need a little extra help hearing the service, we've got hearing assistance devices at the AV booth. Just pop them on and adjust the volume to your comfort level. And for those who need it, we also offer real-time language translation devices that can translate the service into one of 40 languages. Stop by the Connect Corner to get set up. Awesome, but that's it for now. We can't wait to see you at all these wonderful events. We hope you have an encounter with God today. Have an awesome Sabbath, everyone. Bye! Bye! I know I'm biased, but those are two of my grandchildren. I think they did a great job. It's now time for the children to come forward. You can collect an offering if you would like. It'll be for our BAS uh, restoration, and then we'll have a children's story up here. today, huh? Well, my story is about two girls, one named Jasmine and one named Nicole. They were best friends. You know what it means to be best friends? What? They like really being together, huh? They sure do. And that was what was going to happen today. These two girls got to spend the day at Nicole's house all day. 
They had lunch with Nicole's dad and mom. And then after that, dad said, how about a bike ride? Do you have bikes? Yeah, do you like to ride your bikes? I have a trike, a recline. Uh, well, we won't go into that. I like to ride my bike too, OK? And they were going to go for a drive in the car to look for a good place to ride their bike. Well, dad found a perfect spot. And he stopped and he said, there's a bike trail that goes up the hill a little bit. And on the other side is a park. Do you ever go to a park? Yes, and there's swings. Yeah, and there's a slide. Boy, they were going to have fun. But they had to get the bikes off of the car. And they, everybody had to get on their bike. And they did that. But they had to try to get up the hill. And Jasmine looked at that hill and said, oh, that's a big hill for me to get up. But I'm going to make my legs go as fast as they can. And she got close to the top. Uh-oh, I don't think I'm going to make it. Somebody pushed her. It was the dad. He gave her a little push, and up the hill she went. And she could look out, and she could see trees. She saw a creek with water running in it. And beyond that, she saw the park, all green grass. Oh, boy, and down we go. She rode down, and they came into the park. And Nicole and Jessica uh, Jasmine, sorry about that, decided to run around the sprinklers. Can we dodge the sprinklers? You ever seen them in the park? Big sprinklers, and they go around like this. I can get away from one of those, or I can get wet, and I'll get cooler. Well, after doing that for a while, the mom said, I'm sorry, but it's time to go back. Oh, OK. So everybody gets on their bike. But Jasmine gets on hers last. And she has trouble going back up the hill. And she was tired. And so she had to get off and walk. She didn't like that. She walked to the top of the hill. And she looked. And they were down there lower. And she wanted to be there, too. She didn't want to be left out. So she gets on her bike, and she says, I'm going to ride my bike real fast. And she started pedaling and pedaling. And you know what happened? She started to lose control. And she'd swear this way, and she'd catch herself, and she'd swear that way, and she'd catch herself. And then she went, help, help. I don't know how to stop. And she began to drag her feet. And Nicole's mom saw her, and she said, a prayer. Dear Jesus, help her and help me to be able to stop her. We don't want her to get hurt. And so you know what she did? She put her arms out wide, stepped in the way. She looked to one side and was the creek. And she looked over a little bit. And there were big rocks. And that wasn't safe. And she said to Jasmine, ride to me. Come to me. And she's coming really fast, and her eyes are getting really big, and oh, no. And crash. She bumped right in to Nicole's mom. And the bike went one way, and Nicole, no, not Nicole, Jasmine, <laughs> and the mom rolled another way. Well, when they stopped, they looked at each other. They brushed themselves off. She had a cut in her lip. She had a bad knee. And the mom had a good little cut on her leg. But you know, they were all safe. It could have been so much worse. They gave each other a great big hug. And then they thanked Jesus for keeping them safe. He answers prayers. Boys and girls, he cares about what happens to you. And he will answer your prayer. Who would like to pray? Okay.
Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for helping us and help us to be good and help Jasmine and her mom feel better. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much. I think you need to stay, okay? Thank you. Come up here with us so we can sing today. But first, actually, sorry, get your little praise stick from Miss Anastasia first. All right, church family, we invite you guys as well to sing this, our this. song today, Jesus Loves Me. You, you go ahead and do this. King David desperately wanted to build the temple. But the Lord had other plans because uh, David had been a man of war and committed some serious sins. And so he told David that he could not build the temple, but his son Solomon was going to build it. But David uh, did not become bitter. Instead, he raised most of the money that was used to build the temple. And that is, some of that story is in 1 Chronicles 29, and the first uh, eight verses tells about, he, off, he called for the offering for the people of Israel, and they just brought in gold and silver and precious stones and everything else, and the craftsmen were willing to work, and it was like five talents of gold and ten talents of silver, that's a lot, plus precious stones, and... Um, and then in verse 9, after all of these offerings were brought in, it says, Then the people rejoiced, for they offered willingly. Because with a perfect heart, they offered willingly to Jehovah, and David the king also rejoiced with great joy. You know, a lot of offering appeals, you, and when you think of offering, sometimes rejoicing doesn't go with that. Willing, not begrudging. Uh, do we rejoice when we pay our taxes? No. I hope offering doesn't fall into that same category. But it doesn't fall into that category because David then goes on and states the following about this offering. Wherefore, the, David blessed Jehovah before, before all the assembly. And he said, You are our God, of Israel, our Father. Thine, O Jehovah, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Jehovah, 
and thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you. Thou rulest over all, and in thy hand is power and might, and in thy hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. And that's why we give our offering, because we're giving our offering to this God. Shall we bow our heads? Our Father, which art in heaven, we thank you for the privilege to give to you. We thank for the privilege that we have been given the truth about you and the understanding that we have been given. Help us to apply it to our lives and hope that this offering and our lives will be used for your glory and that this earth will soon be over and we will be in your kingdom. In Christ's name, amen. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Church, happy Sabbath. happy Sabbath. So as you can see, we have beautiful people, a lot of people here singing. And we want to invite you to sing with us too. It's not only us. Because we're going to worship the one and only King of Kings and Lords and Lords of Lords. You see, when every time that I bring a lot of people together to sing, it's kind of like me imagining how worship in heaven is going to be. Because my passion is music and God and talking about Jesus, so why not combine worship and Jesus today in our church? And so I want I want uh, the set list that we have today is about Christ, everything that He did for you and me. Because I'm a firm believer that we're gonna sing about His goodness forever and ever. Amen. And see, if we don't practice today, I don't think you're gonna get used to it when we go there. So. For the first time, I invite you to I invite you to stand up and sing with us these beautiful hymns.
talk about how God commands our life. He commands our destiny. He sits in, in, in victory. But if it wasn't for that sacrifice, what would have happened to us? Have you ever thought of that? So that's why we see worthy is the land because he did it all for us in that cross. And so we're going to worship him forever and ever because he's so good.
for you and me and the only thing that he calls you to do or he asks you to do is surrender so as we sing this song I invite you to surrender and give it all to Jesus because he deserves to be praised for the only thing that he asks is for your heart so as we sing I invite you to to meditate in these words and give it all to him Let me 
Heavenly Father, we come to you as a church family this morning saying from our heart that we do surrender all to you. Father, we surrender the challenges we face this week, placing them at the foot of the cross knowing that you will do what's best in our lives. Father, we thank of those who are suffering especially the Southeast United States, people without food, refrigeration, air conditioning, homes, and so many have lost everything. Father, today, we pray that you will give them peace that goes beyond human understanding. We pray that the resources of this great nation will be of such that will be able to aid them in the recovery process. Father, there's not only been great tragedies, there's been private ones as well. Some of us have had a difficult week. We faced issues that have vexed our souls. And we say, Father, whatever you desire is good enough for us. We pray, Father, that you will anoint each hurting person, that you will take our wayward hearts and draw us closer to your arms this morning. We pray for the forgiveness of our sins and the cleansing of your Holy Spirit. We ask, Father, now that you will anoint the lips of our pastor. The words that he brings will be the words from your throne that our hearts will be open to the influence of your Holy Spirit, that we will cry out, whatever you desire, Father, is what we shall do. We pray, Father, that we will have a humble heart that is approachable to all. Bless our worship service. Send us out as being ambassador of blessings to our community. For we ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Our scripture today is 1 Samuel 13, 14. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of his people, because you have not kept the Lord's command.
Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. What a beautiful day to be in the Lord's house this morning. Amen. Amen. I just want to welcome you once more. If you're online, we're so excited that you're with us. Um, This is a place where we are committed to finishing the ministry of Christ through love and action. Uh, Last weekend, if you took part in our service Sabbath, then I know that not only were you blessed, but you were a real blessing. Um, We're going to be making serving in um, some of these assisted living homes and communities Um, more of our regular rhythm. So look for announcements. We're going to go again next month, so you'll have another opportunity. Because we want to be the hands and feet of Jesus. We want to bring hope and life and love and light into the dark world around us, which is why we're looking at this sermon series that we're currently looking at, A Servant Heart. Two Sabbaths ago, we learned that a servant's heart is content. That's That's when our sermon series began, that it's content, in all things content, trusting God, being content first in Him, in who He is, in what He can do, in what He has done, and what He is asking of you to do, being content in God. You can go back uh, online and watch uh, any of these sermons that we've missed or you've missed. We'd love for you to do that. Last Sabbath, Pastor Danny had a wonderful message on the servant's heart that is humble. Maybe you remember. Maybe you were here for that. And you were reminded that God chose this lowly shepherd, nobody, David of all people. And it's amazing to me when we hear that sermon shared how God will take the least and make the most to be humble. Today's message, we continue with the characteristics of a servant heart, and so we've learned that that C is content, H is humble, and today we tackle A, and even though it says in your bulletin, approachable, it's actually accountable, and that's on me that the error is in that bulletin, so I'm accountable today. To that typo, that is on me. Liz asked me no less than three times before she left, did I get the slides right? And I said, oh, yeah, you got it right, because she always gets it right. And, you know, that's on me. Today is accountable. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come into your presence this morning wanting desperately to communicate to you how much we love you and how incredible and awesome And holy and just you are. And at the same time that we bring you accolades and praise and worship, Father, we want to hear from you. Because we want to be more and more like you every day. So would you hide me away? Would you speak words to us today that we might leave here more like you? That we might leave here changed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I think it's fitting that as we talk about what it means to have a servant's heart, that last Sabbath we talked about David. You know, David demonstrated so many wonderful leadership characteristics. I don't know if you've ever studied or looked closely at the life of David. Uh, He is certainly someone that we can look to as a role model, as someone to, to follow. He, he demonstrated humility, even after being anointed king. I, I don't know what that would be like to be anointed king. Even being anointed the very next king, he continued to serve his father as this lowly shepherd. He was pleased to go on his father's errands. He wasn't haughty. He wasn't arrogant. He didn't present himself as high and mighty. I mean, what an awesome example. I mean, after all, David, we look at him and his spirituality, his, his walk with God. He, in fact, he was so close to God that God paid David the highest compliment anyone could ever receive. And you know what that compliment was. We, we just heard it beautifully shared in our scripture reading this morning. Thank you, Caitlin, for reading for us this morning. You heard what that compliment was. Samuel talking to Saul, he says, your kingdom's not going to endure. The Lord has sought out a man who? After his own heart. 
Samuel, referring to David, says that God will now put on the throne of Israel a man after God's own heart. And it's interesting because I think of all the reasons that we remember David, this has to be the pinnacle, don't you think? I mean, other than Jesus, David is probably remembered as the greatest king in Israel. He was a white knight. He was a hero. We, we remember David for slaying that dreaded giant Goliath, don't we? Oh, David, he picked up those five smooth stones, not because he thought he'd miss four times, but because he was going to take care of Goliath's four other brothers, too. <laughs> David. We, we remember David soothing and calming Saul, who, who was kind of crazy with beautiful music. We remember David praying to God for deliverance and relying on God to vindicate him when Saul was chasing him and persecuting him and even trying to, to kill him. We remember David not killing Saul when he could have. Sparing him. And not only did David spare Saul, but David actually slayed the man who killed Saul, saying, how is it that you're not afraid to raise your hand against the Lord's anointed? We remember David's incredible faith. Do you remember this? His unwavering devotion to God, a fearless leader, a wonderful musician, a faithful friend. We remember David for all of that, but none of it compares to being remembered because he, because he has a heart like God. I mean, that, that, is, that is tops to me. I mean, if you could choose anything to be remembered for, maybe you'd choose that. I think I would. God, to say you have a heart after mine. What kind of characteristics do you have to possess to have a heart after God's anyway? You know? I read a verse that David wrote himself, actually, that I think helps capture, encapsulate what it means to have a heart after God, have God's own heart. Uh, David writing, he says, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. And David acknowledges something so important here. He says, what does he say? Read it with me. I have no good apart from you. Let's, let's read that one. Let's read that out again. David talking to the Lord. He says, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. Now, I love what Ellen White writes in Patriarchs and Prophets. She said, all the good qualities that men possess are the gift of God. Their good deeds are performed, how? By the grace of God, through Christ. In other words, David recognized as a young man that the only good in him was God in him. I don't know. I think sometimes it's very tempting to feel ourselves. You know what I'm saying? Start to feel good about how we're doing. Start to feel a little righteous sometimes. Sometimes I think we sound a little like the rich young ruler. I've kept all these laws from my youth. What more? And David recognizing here the only good in him is God in him. And God pays him this incredible compliment. A compliment that is no better. He, God says, you have a heart just like mine. And if you get that compliment from God as far as I'm concerned, you're done. <laughs> I mean, you're set. What more is there? You've reached the greatest pinnacle this side of heaven. How much higher can you go? David was a man after God's own heart. A champion. Pinnacle of spirituality. And what makes, which makes what we see happen next that much more difficult to take. To understand, really. The David that we so fondly remember the David who is a man after God's own heart isn't the David that we see in 2 Samuel chapter 11. If you have your Bibles, open with me to 2 Samuel chapter 11. David, the man that we just talked about who, who had, was filled with faith, who was filled with courage, a man who was so faithful to the Lord, is not the man that we see here. 
Look at what the Bible says. It says in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David, but David, oh, that word but, but David remained in Jerusalem. And one evening, David got up from his bed and he he walked around on the roof of the palace. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. And she was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. And the man said, this is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And then David sent messengers to get her and she came to him and he slept with her and Now, she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. And then she went back home, and the woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I'm pregnant. Who who, who is this David? Who who is he? That that is not the David we, we just talked about. I mean, I mean, this David, this David took another man's wife, and now she's pregnant. Oh, if only the story could get better from here. It doesn't, if you keep reading. David tries to cover it up. He calls Uriah back from the battle with some baloney excuse about needing a report from the war. And Uriah comes and he shares with David at the palace. And David wanting Uriah to go home on this furlough, right, and spend some quality time with his wife so that maybe they could, they could say that the pregnancy was a natural response from this time away from war between husband and wife. You following me? But instead, Uriah, this faithful soldier, says, I'm not going to go home, sir. I'm going to stay at the castle, and I'm going to be at the palace. I'm going to wait right here doing and serving you as I've been commanded. I will not leave my post. David doesn't know what to do. So what's he do? He sends Uriah back to battle with a note that says, put him on the front lines. And attack an unwinnable position, essentially murdering Uriah. And of course, word gets back now to Bathsheba that her husband is dead. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. And after the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house. And she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done, (laughs) of course it did. It displeased the Lord. Why? Of course it displeased the Lord. Does this sound like the David that we just talked about? Right, it doesn't. The David that we were just referring to a few moments ago, I think that David would have gone off to war with his generals. He would have gone with the ark of God. He would have commanded them. The David that we were just talking about wouldn't have been high on that wall looking out over the city at a time of day when women are taking baths. He certainly wouldn't have summoned her to come to his palace. He wouldn't have murdered her husband to cover up what he had done. The David that we were referring to just a few moments ago would have been courageous and would have had integrity in the midst of this horrible mistake. But this David is fearful. He's sneaky. He's trying to cover everything up. The David that we remembered wasn't a murderer, but valued human's life, human life, even Saul's life. David. You know, as I look at this story, the David that we see here in, in 2 Samuel is totally unrecognizable. doesn't look anything like the David that is a man after God's own heart. This David has fallen. And maybe the saddest part, church, is he doesn't even realize it. Yeah, that's, that, that's a crazy thought, isn't it? <laughs> how far he has gone. And, and he, doesn't even, he doesn't even realize it. Which, which reminds me why it is so important that we have a daily dependence on God. This is why it is so critical that our walk with Jesus be moment by moment and day by day that, it, that, it, that we cannot rest on a relationship that we had with Jesus even just yesterday. Our walk with him must be fresh and and new. 
Because, I, because here's, the, here's the reality. We are either walking more and more closely with Jesus or we are walking more farther and farther away from him. There is no static in this relationship. Right? We're either, we're either with him more and more or farther and farther away. And the moment that we start to rely on a relationship with Jesus that we had at a time in the past, even if it was just yesterday, is the moment that we begin to end up potentially in a situation like David has found himself in, completely unrecognizable, completely detached, and worse yet, not even realizing it. Now, maybe you're thinking, come on, how do you, how do you know David didn't know? How badly he messed up. How is it that he hadn't realized what he had done? And the very next chapter in Samuel gives us some context as to where David's thought process was in this whole ordeal. The very next chapter, 2 Samuel, chapter 12. David is minding his own business. He's probably running city affairs, country affairs, Whatever, just like he had normally done, when maybe his aide walks in and says, Sir, we have a visit from the Lord's prophet, Nathan, and he would love your your company. And, of course, David probably loved Nathan. He said, Yeah, let him in. Let's talk. And this is what happened. The Lord sent Nathan to David, and when he came to him, he said to David, there were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. And the rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food. It it drank from his cup. It even slept in his arms. Isn't this wonderful? It was like a daughter to him, this lamb. You ever had a pet like that? This is, I'm not going to go off on a tangent about pets being in heaven, but God certainly blesses us with our furry family members, doesn't he? And this sheep was no exception. It's like a daughter to him. And now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb, oh, that precious lamb, that belonged to the poor man, and he prepared it for the one who had come to him. Look at David's response to this. David burned with anger, the Bible says. Burned with anger against the man, and he said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, what what will happen? The man who did this must die. Now understand, King David... (laughs) He, he's the judge. He can make that. That is certainly within his purview to make happen. And he says this man must die. He must pay for the lamb four times over because he did such a bad thing and had no pity. David doesn't even realize what he has done. He's, he, he doesn't even get it. As Nathan is telling him the story, David's anger is burning against this man, this, this ruthless, cold-hearted, rich man, and he doesn't even realize it's him. And he, he's, he even indicts himself. He says, this guy should die. Nathan, David, you are that man. <laughs> wow. What a moment. Right? What a moment. Nathan, in that, in that moment, strips David of his secret. And the first time in a long time, David's eyes are open. You did this, David. You did this. When you took another man's wife to be your own, when you killed Uriah in battle to cover up the whole thing, you did this, David. David. It's interesting how just a few moments ago, David is furious because this rich man had no pity for the poor man. And now David was face to face with the reality of what he had done, how far he had fallen. This man who was, had the heart after God has now become this wretched, sinful, heartless individual. You are this man, David. Your secret is out. 
You know what they say, don't you? Uh, you can fool some of the people all the time and all of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all of the people all the time. Friends, we can't fool God any of the time. He knows where we've been, what we've been up to. He knows our thoughts. He knows our heart. He knows everything there is to know about you. He knows. And he loves you anyway. Isn't that amazing? Uh, maybe it's just amazing that he loves me anyway. He loves us anyway. God knows. And David, who did this thing in private, he thought he could cover it up. He thought it could be buried. And now he's staring it face to face. David, you are this man. Now, I, I, look, it is not lost on me that David is the king. Right? David is the king. Nathan rolls up in his house and says to David, you are a murdering adulterer, David. I don't know if, if you're like me, uh, it's hard to be corrected. Do you have a hard time being corrected? Do we like correction? <laughs> yeah, it's hard. In fact, they tell us the strategy to constructive criticism is you make a sandwich. You ever made a sandwich for somebody? You do a positive and then a negative and then the positive again to try to just smooth it all out at the end. You gotta, you gotta eat the thing like a sandwich. Nathan did not give David a sandwich. He gave him a gut punch, didn't he? He straight up, you are that man. Now, David, being a king and probably like us, not liking to be corrected, I mean, he's a, he's a human. David had a, certainly a lot of options that he had at play here, right? And what I love about this moment is because here in this moment, we start to get a glimpse again as to why God said, David has a heart after mine. Why, why we get to see this heart of David start to reappear. Because David could have responded to Nathan in any number of ways, couldn't he? He could have threatened him. He could have said, you shut your mouth, don't say another word, or else. He could have had Nathan killed. That wasn't uncommon. Killing the prophets happened all the time. David could have defended himself. Hold on a second. That's not me. He could have denied it. He could have done those things, but he didn't. What did David do? David, instead, he chose to be accountable to Nathan. Rather than defending his position, rather than reacting with power, rather than denying it, David heard Nathan, and in that moment, because he was listening, he was changed. Friends, do you know what it means to be accountable? I, I meant to put the, definition, the dictionary definition on the screen, and I think that one eluded me. But the dictionary says that accountable is this, subject to giving an account, answerable. Subject to giving an account, answerable. David had no real reason to have to give an answer to Nathan, except that he chose to be willing to hear God speak through Nathan. And he recognized that the man of God was speaking to him, that, that God was speaking through him, and he allowed himself, the king, to be answerable. And through this open posture, God worked a miracle in David's life. Because now the memory of every bad decision that David had been making was now colliding with every memory of a good and gracious God. You know, it's interesting. I, I just imagine that as Nathan brings that to David's attention, everything that Nathan or David had tried to bury about that moment is now resurfacing, and he's remembering all of those moments that he made those horrible decisions, and at the same time he's doing that, he can't help but remember the time when he was a man after God's own heart, when he was in a right relationship with the Father, 
and he's, he's thinking about what he did, and then he's reminded of God's goodness, and he's thinking about how he behaved, and he's thinking about God's justice and love and mercy and forgiveness, and he's thinking about how he covered it up, and he's reminded about God's deliverance. Like, these things are happening simultaneously. And in that moment, there's clarity. Because that clarity reveals to him how good God is and how wretched he has become. And that is a posture of change. You know, when we come into a holy God's presence, if, if we aren't feeling anything, if we, if we aren't feeling some tinge of unworthiness, God is so good. David realizing his condition. And, and he does hear what I would expect a man after God's own heart to do. He cries out to God. And, and I love how David is so open, you know. He, he literally writes psalms down and, and gives us this exposure into his experience, into his heart, into his emotions, into his feelings. And he shares with us this broken and sincere heart in Psalm 51. Look at, look at what he writes to this very specific moment, he says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So, you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness. Even in the womb, you taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Do you hear his heart today? He says, create in me a pure heart, O God. I love that verse, don't you? And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Don't cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Oh, this is all, this is, this moment of David is because he was open to hearing a word from the Lord. And I can't help but think, friends, I, I, what would have happened if Nathan had never approached David? What would have happened if, if Nathan had not gone? I mean, certainly God speaks to us through the Holy Spirit. He, he pricks our conscience and, 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 and we have to deal with some of those inner turmoils. He certainly speaks to us through his word, doesn't he? We read something in scripture and we're like, oh man, that is not where I'm at. And there's a correction happening. But there are times when God sends a person. Maybe the person's praying Maybe the person comes and speaks. But what happens if Nathan doesn't approach David? What would have happened if no one did? I want you to see something. David shares with us how he was living. He shares with us how he was feeling. There, there is a psalm, Psalm chapter 32, where we see what David was experiencing. Unrepentant. David shares it with us. This is, this is speaking to the very same situation, church. The Psalms are not chronologically written, by the way. He says, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven. Whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and whose spirit is no deceit. Listen to what David's saying. He says, when I kept silent, what is the silence that he kept? His lack, of, his lack of confession. His lack of taking it to the Lord. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. Does that sound like a, a wonderful life experience? Does that sound like uh, just a, a good day? 
I mean, his bones are crushed. The hands, Lord, is heavy on him. My strength was sapped as in the heat of the summer. This is David. This is how he's feeling. This is what he's experiencing, what he's going through before Nathan approaches him. He said, my life, I mean, you could paraphrase, I was miserable. It is a servant's heart that allows themselves to be accountable. But maybe more important, maybe more important than just holding, allowing ourselves to be accountable is the one who's willing to go and hold the one in sin accountable. Does that make sense? Like we, we can certainly have an open posture. We need to be accountable and listen. But in other words, maybe what was more important here in this moment was that Nathan went. That Nathan went. You know, one of the synonyms to accountable is responsible. I think Nathan felt a responsibility from God to go to David to speak life and truth back into David. And that is a hard ask, isn't it? I mean, that is a hard ask. I, I don't know if you've ever heard the expression, my name's Bennett and I ain't in it. You ever heard that one? No? Just me? It, may, it might just be me. Yeah, I, I, we'll, just, we'll chalk that up as East Coast slang. Um, my name is Bennett and I ain't in it. Well, it's just an expression that basically means I'm not going to get involved. I, I, I have, I'm not going to get involved. And, and that is a posture that is very easy for us to take. Because to get involved sometimes is unpopular. To get involved sometimes when you see a loved one or a friend in error could cost that friendship. It could cost the relationship. In fact, to, to go and be a, someone who, who shares what is righteous with someone could even bring you harm. I remember when I was in seminary, um, a professor made this statement in class. I don't remember which professor it was, so I just put unknown, author unknown. I, I'm not sure. But I remember the statement. It says, if you have, you have no business correcting the errors of others unless you're willing to die for them. Wow. You have no business correcting the errors of others unless you're willing to die for them. And you may read that and go, well, I'm not willing to die for them, so I won't get involved. My name's Bennett, and I ain't in it. But that's not what that means. See, it isn't that we don't get involved because we don't love them enough. No, 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 no. The challenge here is that we love people enough. Look at what Jesus says in John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Friends, we need to be willing to die for those who are not living in life. We need to love like like Jesus loves. We need to get involved. The heart of a servant, though, isn't going around beating people up with passive aggressiveness. That's not what I'm talking about. Right? I'm not talking about these maybe a flippant remark or, or a guilt-laden statement to somebody. People with the heart of a servant aren't looking for opportunity to judge someone. Especially when they're probably dealing with their own issues. Church, this is the heart of a believer who with Christ-like love directly confronts sin for someone else's sake and for their spiritual wholeness. It is risking yourself to engage with someone else that they might see their error and become right with God. Does that make sense? Because bringing someone back into a saved relationship with Jesus is what we are called to do. Did you know that? 
I hope you see the difference. Not only was David accountable in this moment, but so was Nathan. Nathan was faithful to God, and he went to David. And I just can't help but wonder if Nathan hadn't gone, would David have continued in the condition that he was in? But because, because Nathan went, look at what David writes in, in that Psalm 32.5. Then I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I'll confess my transgressions to the Lord. And guess what the Lord did? He forgave the guilt of his sins. Weren't we told that in 1 John 1, 9? Right? If you confess your sins, he's what? Faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, it's not enough to be accountable as a servant of the Most High with a Christ-like love. We are to help others find their way back to Jesus. You know, I know that we've been using that word accountable today. Largely because I needed the A for the acronym character. But I want us to think maybe of a better word. Reconcile. As God's people, we are to reconcile sinners back to the loving, into a loving relationship with the Heavenly Father. This is the example and mission of Jesus when he left glory and came into this sin-filled world. When Jesus died on that cross as, as an atonement for you, he did it so that your sins could be forgiven and so that you could once again have that perfect relationship that we once had with the Father before we fell into sin in this world. Right, All of that could be restored through Jesus. And Paul gives us some some instruction, he says, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should what? To restore that person gently. Right? Bring them back. Because that's what Christ has done for you and for me. You know, I want to close with this text in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17 through 21. Paul speaking, he says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us what? The ministry of reconciliation. The Holy Spirit wants to work in you and through you to bring unbelievers into a saved relationship with Jesus. That God has, was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's what? Ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us. Think about the partnership with God he allows us to have. Oh, mercy. That God would, as if God were speaking through you to somebody else. We implore you. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become, friends, the righteousness of God. Church, this is the hope and want of Jesus for every human being living and breathing today. For every human being, for every person struggling in the world today with whatever is going on in their life, their desire is that they be reconciled to the Father. Jesus' desire is that when he comes again, no one should perish. And he's called those of us with a servant's heart to be accountable, to reconcile a fallen world through the same gospel you have been redeemed with. Maybe David said it best. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Friends, look around the world we are in right now. Not enough to be distracted, but enough to realize Jesus is coming soon. Amen? Nations are at war. Our church is struggling with division. The earth is destroying itself. Friends, don't be distracted from the mission that God has given us. But be urgent. So may you recognize your need for Jesus. May you be willing to hear the Lord as he 
calls you into righteousness and may you have the courage to help others see their need for Jesus is my prayer for you today. Would you stand with me as we close out our worship this morning singing about the cross, the hope, the joy, the promise that we have in Jesus. stand here this afternoon asking for the Holy Spirit to do something in us, whether it's courage, whether it's just an exuberant joy, something where you can be manifested and seen by those around us. We have a message, Lord, of hope like none other. We just want to share it with the world. Use us to that end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful, happy Sabbath. If anyone would like to come forward for prayer, uh, Del would love to pray with you this afternoon. God bless you. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the